Gregory Smith-Simmon, Professor of Sociology at Brooklyn College, wrote in 2018 that race is a power relationship. The following video lesson will explore this idea. Article 1, Section 2, Clause 3 of the US Constitution divided people into white, black or Indian, which were meant to stand in for power categories. Those eligible for citizenship, those subjected to brutal enslavement and those targeted for genocide. In the first census, each resident counted as one person, each slave as three-fifths of a person, and each Indian was not counted at all. An early US census instructed people to leave the race section blank if they were white, and indicate only if they were something else. This engendered a sense that whites could imagine themselves as the norm, and that only other people had race. This is where the power of race becomes more apparent. The racial privilege of whites is evident throughout history and in virtually all aspects of life, from education, health, housing, employment and law and order. Many would argue that this continues on today. The Black Lives Matter Global Network calls for radical, sustainable solutions that affirm the prosperity of black lives. The movement was founded in 2013 in response to the acquittal of Trayvon Martin's murderer, George Zimmerman, in February 2012. The movement gained momentum in 2020 following the death of George Floyd while in police custody in Minneapolis, Minnesota. On May 25, 2020, George Floyd, an unarmed African-American, died after being handcuffed lying face down on a city street during an arrest. During the arrest, police officer Derek Chauvin knelt on Floyd's neck for 8 minutes 46 seconds. Floyd begged for his life, saying repeatedly, I can't breathe. The murder was filmed by a witness. Four days later, Chauvin was charged with third-degree murder and second-degree manslaughter. The charges were met with public outrage. On the 3rd of June, the charge against Chauvin was upgraded to second-degree murder. President Trump called the murder of Floyd very sad and tragic and subsequently signed an executive order banning chokeholds by law enforcement agents. Trump did, however, retweet a message in which American conservative commentator Candace Owens attacked the character of George Floyd. Trump was also accused of disrespecting Floyd's memory when he claimed that Floyd was looking down and rejoicing this great day over better than expected employment figures, as this video clip will show. Equal justice under the law must mean that every American receives equal treatment in every encounter with law enforcement, regardless of race, color, gender or creed. They have to receive fair treatment from Law enforcement, they have to receive it. We all saw what happened last week. We can't let that happen. Hopefully, George is looking down right now and saying, this is a great thing that's happening for our country. This is a great day for him. It's a great day for everybody. This is a great day for everybody. This is a great, great day in terms of equality. It's really what our Constitution requires, and it's what our country is all about. I just want to finish by saying to save the economy, we passed several pieces of critical legislation, totaling many trillions of dollars, meaning three. We're set up to do more if we want. I think we should because we, uh, we are dominant. For many years as a bystander, but somebody that loved government, somebody that loved this country, I would watch and study and see and just, you know, when I say study, naturally study, by watching. But if you go back, China was going to catch us in 2019. And that was like a given. You know, they, you go back five years, six years, seven years. It was always, yeah, China will catch America, catch the United States and in 2019. And then it will become the dominant economy. Never happened. It's not going to happen. We dominated them over the last year and a half, two years. Anti-racism supporters view these events as evidence that little has improved for African Americans since the Jim Crow laws that legalize racial segregation. Named after a black minstrel show character, the laws which existed for about a hundred years from the post-Civil War era until 1968 were meant to marginalize African Americans by limiting their right to vote, hold jobs, 
get an education and many other opportunities besides. The legal system was stacked against black citizens, with former Confederate or pro-slavery soldiers working as police and judges, making it difficult for African Americans to win court cases. Black offenders usually received longer prison sentences than their white counterparts. The emergence of white supremacy groups such as the KKK or Ku Klux Klan in the 1860s served to terrorise black communities. KKK members included prominent US politicians, police officers and lawyers. Black schools and churches were bombed and violent attacks in the form of lynchings against African Americans were commonplace. Rosa Parks, Martin Luther King and Malcolm X emerged as leaders of the civil rights movement and raised the profile of rights for African Americans. Both male activists were assassinated. The black power movement grew out of the civil rights movement. This movement of the 1960s and 1970s emphasised racial pride, economic empowerment and the creation of political and cultural institutions. The Black Panther Party was established in this era in order to challenge police brutality against the African-American community. It was founded in the wake of the assassination of Malcolm X and after police in San Francisco shot and killed an unarmed black teen, Matthew Johnson. The group drew upon Marxist ideology for their direction. They focused on principles of equality and justice for all. They started free breakfast programs for school children and free health clinics in 13 African-American communities across the USA. The group was tarnished by criminal activities and faced FBI investigation. In 1969, the FBI declared the Black Panthers as a communist organization and an enemy of the US government. During the medal ceremony at the 1968 Summer Olympics in Mexico City, two African-American athletes, Tommy Smith and John Carlos, each raised a black gloved fist during the playing of the US national anthem. All three athletes on the podium wore human rights badges in solidarity. Smith and Carlos received their medals shoeless but wearing black socks to represent black poverty. Smith wore a black scarf to represent black pride. Carlos had his tracksuit top and zip to show solidarity with blue-collar workers in the US and wore a necklace of beads which he described were for those individuals that were lynched or killed and that no one said a prayer for, that were hung and tarred. It was for those thrown off the boats in the Middle Passage. This was a monumental moment in history and an example of an overt political statement made through an international sporting platform. Smith and Carlos were subsequently expelled from the Olympic Village and on returning home received death threats. They were accused of bringing shame on their nation. The following Channel 4 News report explores this event further. Chris. Thanks, Cathy. Now it's one of the most striking images an Olympic Games has ever produced. At the Mexico Games of 68, two African-American athletes stood on the winner's podium, heads bowed, gloved hands raised in a black power salute. Their protest was against segregation and racism in America, the symbolism made more potent by the single black glove each wore. The unintended consequence of bronze medalist John Carlos forgetting to bring his pair along. The man receiving gold was Tommy Smith, a formidable runner whose world record for the 200 meter sprint stood for 11 years. But like the two other athletes, his sports career was blighted by his actions. His achievements on and off the track were only recognised much later. At the time, both Americans were expelled from the Olympics and all were ostracised by many of their countrymen on their returns home. Tommy Smith never raced again. He's here with me now, though. Thank you very much for nice here, joining Chris. us. What was going through your mind when you did that? Why did you do it? Because a lot of people assume it's a militant gesture. Yeah, well, it's, 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 it was a militant uh, uh, military isn't either, but uh, something has to be done. It was done for a reason, a, a, a social justice uh, uh, brought by by ignorance uh, of, of man, uh, of those who do not believe in human rights, uh, or who wouldn't give the necessity of thought in uh, dealing with that particular human rights. And I think it's very important. The, 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 the victory stand was, you might say, a pinnacle of what I had to do, what people had to see before they could believe that we really understood. Did you have any idea what impact it would have? No, I didn't. No, I didn't. It, 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 I didn't do it for a necessity of, 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 of religious uh, combinations. Only a, a, a realization that human rights efforts were needed all around the world to cement the power of man and not to be malignant about anything. Because the argument given at the time by your critics, despite the 36 games, yeah. 
Yeah. Was was politics and the Olympics don't mix? Yeah, yeah. Oh uh, yeah, po politics mixes in everything. You flush your bathroom, you got to pay the cost. You know, it, every, it mixes in everything. So those who say that are missing the point about politics. It's not that politics is bad. It's how you handle any any instantaneous uh, action about the system, which deal with politics. Politics is good. Politics is there. So do you think today's so athletes should take more of a stand on, on the oh, issues that, that they that's care That's up about? to the athlete, like it was uh, us in 1968. Some athletes decided not to because they didn't think there was a need to. These athletes today, basically, they guess eyes, nose, mouth, ears, the same as we did, but the brain is a little bit different. So they deal with everything a little bit different. Back then, it was the power of pride. Now, mostly, it's the power of the dollar. So they have to deal with what they got to deal with. Do you think America ever forgave you? No, I don't think so. Because they recognized you in the end, didn't they? But well, well, <laughs> the U.S. Olympic Committee has not uh, uh, awarded a, a, a stand for me or John Carlos in the U.S. OC uh, Track and Field Hall of Fame. And I held more war records or, than any man or woman in track and field history, and I'm not there. So there's a reason why that uh, is happening. But that's the U.S. OC. I do think there's good minds in America that deals with the reality of, of that necessity. Christian. The athletes, along with other civil rights and human rights activists, were attempting to shine a light on the shame of the USA and other countries for their active role in creating and maintaining racial inequality, the roots of which lie predominantly in slavery. Historians have long debated whether racism encouraged the development of slavery or slavery stimulated racism. Historian Peter Parrish believes that the most convincing explanation is that the institution of slavery and the clear belief in the racial inferiority of the African marched hand in hand, with each supporting and reinforcing the other. Support for both intensified as the demand for black labour increased, and particularly as the black population grew and became more heavily concentrated in certain areas. It is impossible to be precise, but in the four centuries between 1450 and 1850, over 10 million, perhaps nearer 12 million slaves, were transported from Africa to America and the Caribbean. At the start of the transatlantic slave trade, Africa was a continent of numerous cultures with well-developed political and religious systems in place. However, instead of recognising this wealth of diversity, early European explorers depicted the Africans as pagan savages, for many, this provided adequate justification for their interference. Slavery existed in Africa prior to the Atlantic slave trade, but the Europeans took slavery to an unprecedented level, dehumanising the victims and removing all of their rights. Otterberg Caguano, remembering his capture, wrote in 1787, I was early snatched away from my native country, with about 18 or 20 more boys and girls as we were playing in a field. Some of us attempted in vain to run away, but the pistols and cutlasses were soon introduced, threatening if we offered to stir, we should all lie dead on the spot. The following is an extract from Nigel Sadler's book on the slave trade. Slavery existed as part of a more complex trading network linking Europe, Africa and the Americas. This three-legged trade route became better known as the triangular trade. The first leg saw slave ships loaded with trade products sailing from Europe to Africa. Amongst the items exported were guns and gunpowder. However, giving potential enemies the means to resist was not a good business move, so in most cases the guns were of poor quality. Other items became standard currency, such as cowrie shells from the Indian Ocean, glass beads often made in Italy, iron rods or bars, and copper and bronze bracelets known as manilas. These manilas became a sign of the slave trade and could be worn as a personal adornment, were melted down in Africa to create art and religious figures, or were used as money, remaining a currency in some parts until the 1950s. Alcohol was also exported and used to help smooth out the negotiation process to purchase the enslaved. The second leg of the triangular trade predominantly saw enslaved people being taken to the Americas. After their forced march, the captured Africans, those who had survived the whippings, beatings and rape, were placed into a slave warehouse, also known as a trunk. Initially owned by the king or officials of the local tribes, these warehouses later became managed by slave traders. Conditions in these warehouses were horrific. The Europeans started on a small scale by trading with local villages. However, as profits increased, European countries needed to protect their trade and build forts. The best-known slave fort, or castle, is Elmina Castle in modern-day Ghana, and this was built in 1482 by the Portuguese and seized by the Dutch in 1637. 
the enslaved Africans were led through the castle's infamous door of no return to board the slave ships. Over the next three centuries, the English, Dutch, Swedes, Danes, French and even the German Duchy of Brandenburg joined the Portuguese in setting up castles and forts along the coast to trade with the interior states. Some of the earliest British forts were built or managed by the Royal African Company, who held the British monopoly in the Atlantic slave trade between 1672 and 1698 and needed to protect their trade. They kept the purchased Africans in these forts before sending them onto their ships bound for the Americas. During the purchasing and loading process, the enslaved Africans were carefully monitored by the ship's doctor to ensure that they had no visible signs of disease. After purchase, the Africans would be taken from the slave fort or slave warehouse to wait in canoes that carried them to the ship. Many tried to jump to freedom before being taken down to the ship's hold but those who succeeded in escaping often drowned. Whilst the slave ship was anchored off the coast of Africa, some of the enslaved faced further hardships. They could spend several months in the ship's hold waiting as the captain continued to purchase Africans. The journey across the Atlantic is better known as the Middle Passage, but this sees the trade from a European viewpoint, and the term transatlantic passage is preferred by many. To keep the Africans alive, it was essential the ships were well stocked with food and water, which took up a considerable amount of storage space. To make the ship's journey as profitable as possible, a large quantity of gold and ivory was loaded as well, much of this making its way back to Europe. Other items depended on the changing tastes of the market and included things such as African cloth and metalwork to be sold in the Caribbean or Europe. Life on the slave ships was horrific as the tightly packed human cargo could remain in these cramped conditions for two or three months. Limited sanitation meant disease was rife and the smell of human suffering was overpowering, best described by Alado Equiano, who, in 1789, recalled, I was soon put down under the decks, and there I received such a salutation in my nostrils as I had never experienced in my life. Sailors could smell an approaching slave ship from five miles away. In the hold, the enslaved Africans died where they lay, their bodies remaining chained to fellow Africans, sometimes for days. A quarter of the estimated 12 million Africans loaded for the Americas died during the transatlantic crossing. The captains of some slave ships protected the Africans from abuse and unwarranted punishments, and made sure they gained regular exercise and were fed frequently. Some did this for moral reasons, others for financial reasons. Many slave ship captains just loaded the ships as fully as possible and gave no consideration to the conditions of the enslaved. It is no surprise, therefore, that one in ten slave ships suffered a revolt. Often this was violently stopped by the crew and any disobedience was treated harshly. This included whipping them, cutting off limbs and even throwing the Africans into the sea to drown. There were also individual acts of resistance, the most extreme being enslaved Africans committing suicide or killing their young infants by throwing them into the sea. The final leg of the triangular trade saw the slave ships loaded with produce from the Caribbean, South America and North America returning to Britain. These products were purchased using the revenue from the sale of the enslaved Africans or with gold purchased in Africa. Initially, many items shipped to Europe were to meet the demands of the more wealthy citizens. Eventually, though, as trade increased and prices fell, these products became available to a wider market. These bulky items included sugar, coffee, cocoa, cotton and tobacco. For example, coffee houses grew in popularity. Cocoa, originally introduced for medicinal uses, became a popular drink when sweetened with sugar, and the mills in northern England prized the imported cotton because of its quality and low cost. Many European plantation owners often spent little or no time in the Americas. They used the profits to build up a grand lifestyle in Europe, with big houses and important positions in society. To maintain this status, they would ship luxury items such as turtle meat back to Europe, and these items would be produced at parties as proof of the plantation's social status and standing. George Moses Horton was a slave in North Carolina for 66 years. He published 150 poems about his experiences. The following words are from his poem, Liberty and Slavery. I am reading a poem 
poem by George Moses Horton titled On Liberty and Slavery. I'm reading this poem because I am working on a project on the Exodus and I found Horton's work particularly useful, interesting to me because he worked and toiled and struggled against the ills of slavery and he wrote on the hope of liberty and he passed away in 1883-84, just at a time when official colonialism started in Africa. And I grew up in Cameroon uh, reading about colonialism. And so there is an interesting intersection here that I find between the work of Horton, the struggles for liberty, the experiences of colonialism and slavery, and the Exodus story that I am working on. Alas, and am I born for this, to wear this slavish chain, deprived of all created bliss, through hardship, toil, and pain? How long have I in bondage lain, and language to be free. Alas, and must I still complain, deprived of liberty? O oh, heaven, and is there no relief, this side of the silent grave, to soothe the pain, to quell the grief and anguish of a slave? Come, liberty, thou cheerful sound. Roll through my ravished ears. Come, let my grief in joy be drowned and drive away my fears. Say unto foul oppression, cease, yes, tyrants rage no more, and let the joyful trump of peace now beat the vassal sore. Soar on the pinions of that dove which long has cooed for thee, and breathed her notes from Africa's grove, the sound of liberty. O oh, liberty, thou golden prize, so often sought by blood. We crave thy sacred sun to rise, the gift of nature's God. Bid slavery hide her haggard face, and barbarism fly. I scorn to see the sad disgrace in which enslaved I lie. Dear liberty, upon thy breast I languish to respire and like the swan unto her nest, I'd like to thy smiles retire. O oh, bless asylum, heavenly balm, unto thy bows I flee, and in thy shades the storm shall calm with songs of liberty. Booker T. Washington wrote about his experiences as a slave in his book Up From Slavery, published in 1901. He wrote... I was born a slave on a plantation in Franklin County, Virginia. I'm not quite sure of the exact place or exact date of my birth. Of my ancestry, I know almost nothing. And it is this eradication of heritage and identity that demonstrates the historic power of one race over another. In 2013, academics from UCL found that the British government had paid out £20 million to compensate some 3,000 families that owned slaves for the loss of their property when slave ownership was abolished in Britain's colonies in 1833. Calculated in today's terms, this figure equates to £16.5 billion. The legacy of the history of racial inequality racial inferiority and superiority can still be seen and experienced in the world today and this highlights the power relationship of race. A June 2020 Pew Center poll found that two-thirds of US adults claim to support the Black Lives Matter movement. In the aftermath of George Floyd's murder, Pew found that about 7 in 10 Americans said that they had had conversations about race. The survey also found that 45% of black Americans said that they have been unfairly stopped by police because of their race or ethnicity. Data from the UK government shows that between April 2018 and March 2019, there were four stop and searches for every 1,000 white people, compared with 38 for every 1,000 black people. 
The Equality and Human Rights Commission reported in 2016 that on average, black workers in the UK with a degree earn 23.1% less than white workers with a degree. The Gender Pay Gap campaign reported in 2018 that in the UK, BAME workers are paid around £3.2 billion less than their white counterparts each year. BBC News reported in 2020 that exclusion rates for racism in primary schools have increased by 40% in just over a decade. Child Action Poverty Group reported in 2019 that in the UK, 45% of children from BAME groups are living in poverty, compared with 26% of children in white British families. Inequality can also be seen in the criminal justice system. BAME groups were almost 50% more likely to be arrested under coronavirus laws than white people, according to the Office for National Statistics. Black people account for 3% of the population in the UK, but 8% of deaths in custody, according to data produced by Statista in 2020. Statistics released by Police Scotland in June 2020 highlighted that only 1.4% of its police officers came from the BAME community, compared to 86% who are white British. 2018 data from Statista found that just over 3% of Scotland's population identify as BAME. STV News spoke to individuals about their experiences of everyday racism. Here is one of these reports. We like to feel that Scotland is such a tolerant and open country and we don't have racism here, but that's simply not the case. And I think denying the problem is part of the problem. Even at primary school, um, people would say things like I would experience racial slurs and I always just felt like I didn't fit in. The P word, if I could say that, um, I would be like made fun of and like told that I should like go and make a curry or something. For like a very long time, I felt very uncomfortable in myself. I used to try and wear like makeup to make myself look paler, like fit in more. Um, I remember being like five years old and not fully understanding race and sitting in the bathtub just trying to like wash like my skin away so that I could fit in and stop feeling so alien. You really can't address anything until you accept that there is a problem. And I think institutions, people, society, our country needs to look inwardly and work out what we can do about this. And that can only happen once we accept that there's an issue. Discussions about race are important. Some commentators suggest that there is only one race, the human race while race based on colour or ethnicity is a social and historic construct designed to create and perpetuate divisions in society. Our understanding of race is incomplete and distorted. This makes progressive collective action difficult. Racial hierarchy has no place in this world, and yet it exists and only serves to polarise people. Race is a power relationship in which the non-dominant race may experience oppression, limitation, disadvantages or disapproval. This power relationship can be seen in relation to the Windrush scandal. The Windrush scandal saw thousands of Caribbean immigrants living and working in the UK wrongly targeted by immigration enforcement as a result of the UK government's hostile environmental policies. As a result, many elderly people were suddenly being barred from working, refused access to government services and lost access to welfare benefits. In some cases, they were even detained or deported. A generation of Brits who came here as children have been facing the threat of deportation from the UK. So what? They went to British schools. They worked British jobs. They built British lives. But recently, some were denied healthcare, lost jobs, were detained and faced being thrown out of their country. They are the Windrush generations. So what is the Windrush generation? Between 1948 through to the late 60s, more than half a million people came to the UK from the Caribbean. It was the first wave of Commonwealth immigration. They were invited over by the British government to work in public services and help rebuild the country after the Second World War. Where do you come from? Jamaica. Have you brought your children with you? Yes. How many? Five children. Those children who came here are now pensioners. People like Michael Braithwaite, who left Barbados when he was nine. He was told he was illegal after reapplying for his job in a school a job which he then lost because he couldn't show the right paperwork. Do I belong where I am? 
for what I've been here all this time and to be uh, put in that position, it sort of made me feel like I'm an alien basically or I have no status. Another who has suffered is Hubert Leslie. He came from Jamaica on his mum's passport and found himself out of work as a maintenance man because the Home Office had declared him an illegal immigrant. I feel like an alien in this country. Really? Yeah. Because you if, I've, if I've worked and lived in this country for a long time and the Home Office would come and look at me and tell me that I've got no status in this country and I've worked and I've paid my tax. So what led to the threats of deportation? It's really important to know that the Windrush generation have been living here legally. Tougher immigration rules were brought in by Theresa May when she was Home Secretary, where, in her own words, a hostile environment was created to expel illegal immigrants. Remember those vans? The problem is that a lot of the Windrush generations never applied for a British passport when they arrived here, because back then the kids would have travelled on their parents' passports when they came to this country. When their parents or grandparents passed away, they were then left with no ID of their own. Anthony Bryan came to the UK from Jamaica with his family in 1965. At only seven years old, he arrived on his brother's passport. When he recently tried to apply for his own British passport to visit his mum in Jamaica, he had no proof of ID, so immigration came knocking. They said I'm illegal. Their job is to remove me out of the country. They had a plane ticket for me. And I phoned my missus and I said to her, they tell me that they got a plane ticket for me and they're going to move me out of the country. Anthony is actually one of the lucky ones. He recently found out that he's allowed to stay in his country. When immigration rules changed in 1971, anyone from the Windrush generation living in the UK was automatically given indefinite leave to remain. But the Home Office didn't keep a record of those people, and it's estimated more than 50,000 may not have registered their right to live here. So what did they have to do to stay? To prove they're living legally in the country, they were asked to provide at least one document, sometimes more, like a payslip, medical record, bank statement for every year that they've been in the country. That could mean finding a doctor's note from 50 years ago. I mean, would you be able to find one from three years ago, let alone half a century? For most, the UK is the only home they know. Until now, they have never questioned whether they belonged here. These individuals, having been here from childhood, had no sense in their minds that they're not British. And that is really the tragedy of it. So what has been decided? A U-turn was made after Theresa May was urged by at least 140 MPs across Parliament to change this policy. More than 130,000 people signed a petition asking the government to grant the Windrush generation amnesty. Labour's David Lammy made an impassioned speech to the Home Secretary Amber Rudd in the Commons. This is a day of national shame and it has come about because of a hostile environment policy that was begun under her Prime Minister. The UK Immigration Minister Caroline Noakes admits that terrible mistakes have been made. These are people who we welcomed here way back in the 50s and 60s and it's really important to me that we correct any error and that we send a message of reassurance to people who are here. We want to get this right for them. Theresa May has apologised to Commonwealth leaders for the anxiety caused over the controversy. That's probably a good sign for people here. The only problem is, is that some people might have already been deported. So what happens next? A Windrush task force has now been set up by the Home Secretary Amber Rudd to address the situation. But the Home Office has stressed the importance of a robust immigration policy to root out those who actually are here illegally. Given the attention this story has got, it's likely the government will find a solution to this issue. But for the Windrush generation, will it really make up for the way that many of their lives were turned upside down? Some people reckon this is a possible glimpse into what could happen after Britain leaves the European Union. Now obviously the status of migrants from Europe is a totally different situation to the Windrush generation. But this whole thing has raised questions and concerns over how the Home Office will cope with the changes to the immigration system. The Windrush Lessons Learned Review published in 2018 drew a stark conclusion.
It found that the UK's treatment of the Windrush generation and approach to immigration more broadly was caused by institutional failures to understand race and racism. Institutional racism has been defined as the collective failure of an organisation to provide an appropriate and professional service to people because of their colour, culture or ethnic origin. It can be seen or detected in processes, attitudes and behaviour that amount to discrimination through prejudice, ignorance, thoughtlessness and racist stereotyping which disadvantage minority ethnic people. This definition was enshrined in the McPherson Report prompted by the death of Stephen Lawrence in 1993. Lawrence was a black teenager murdered in a racially motivated attack in London. The McPherson Report concluded that the Metropolitan Police Service was institutionally racist. In the aftermath of the murder, it was uncovered that some undercover officers had been pressured to find ways to smear and discredit the Lawrence family shown here in order to deflect attention from the police response to the case, especially in relation to allegations that some police officers had shielded the alleged killers. Much work is being undertaken to continue the dialogue about racial identity and racism. School curricula are being reviewed and research is being carried out to understand links institutions may have with the slave trade. Dollar Academy fully acknowledged its founder John McNabb's links to the trade and has commissioned further independent research. The Church of England and the Bank of England apologised in 2020 for their links to slavery. Lloyds of London Insurance Company apologised for its role in the trade and pledged to fund opportunities for black and ethnic minority people. Oxford, Cambridge, Bristol, Glasgow and the University of East London are all researching their relationship with and role in the trade and colonialism. Suggestions for reparations for the slave trade and slavery include UK institutions working with Caribbean nations to fund development projects. Acknowledgement of involvement in and benefit from the trade is one method to demonstrate regret for historic wrongs. Tackling the resultant racial inequalities is the next step. Anti-racism activists call for an acknowledgement and greater understanding of white privilege. Robin D'Angelo, author of White Fragility, Why It's So Hard for White People to Talk About Racism, said that White privilege is the automatic, taken-for-granted advantage bestowed upon white people as a result of living in a society based on the premise of white as the human ideal. She also commented that one of the reasons why it's so hard for white people to see white privilege is that it does not serve them to see it. Race is a social and political concept. Race is a powerful political, social and economic force. Twice British Prime Minister Benjamin Disraeli said that race implies difference, difference implies superiority, and superiority leads to predominance. Civil rights activist Audre Lorde believed that although we all possess different identities, we are all connected as human beings. She cautioned us about the ways that our various identities can prevent us from seeing our shared humanity. She wrote, so long as we are divided because of our particular identities, we cannot join together in effective political action. There is no hierarchy of oppressions by Audre Lorde. I was born black and a woman. I am trying to become the strongest person I can become, to live the life I have been given and to help affect change toward a livable future for this earth and for my children. As a black, lesbian, feminist, socialist, poet, mother of two, including one boy and member of an interracial couple, I usually find myself part of some group in which the majority defines me as deviant, difficult, inferior, or just plain wrong. From my membership in all of these groups, I have learned that oppression and the intolerance of difference come in all shapes and sizes and colors and sexualities, and that among those of us who share the goals of liberation and a workable future for our children, there can be no hierarchies of oppression. I have learned that sexism, a belief in the inherent superiority of one sex over all others and thereby its right to dominance, and heterosexism, a belief in the inherent superiority of one pattern of loving over all others and thereby its right to dominance, both arise from the same source as racism, a belief in the inherent superiority of one race over all others and thereby its right to dominance. Oh, says a voice from the black community, but being black is normal. Well, I and many black people of my age can remember grimly the days when it didn't used to be. I simply do not believe that one aspect of myself can possibly profit from the oppression of another part of my identity. 
I know that my people cannot possibly profit from the oppression of any other group which seeks the right to peaceful existence. Rather, we diminish ourselves by denying to others what we have shed blood to obtain for our children. And those children need to learn that they do not have to become like each other in order to work together for a future they will all share. The increasing attacks upon lesbians and gay men are only an introduction to the increasing attacks upon all black people. For wherever oppression manifests itself in this country, black people are potential victims. And it is a standard of right-wing cynicism to encourage members of oppressed groups to act against each other. And so long as we are divided because of our particular identities, we cannot join together in effective political action. Within the lesbian community, I am black, and within the black community, I am a lesbian. Any attack against black people is a lesbian and gay issue because I and thousands of other black women are part of the lesbian community. Any attack against lesbians and gays is a black issue because thousands of lesbians and gay men are black. There is no hierarchy of oppression. It is not accidental that the Family Protection Act, which is virulently anti-woman and anti-black, is also anti-gay. As a black person, I know who my enemies are. And when the Ku Klux Klan goes to court in Detroit to try and force the Board of Education to remove books the Klan believes hint at homosexuality, then I know I cannot afford the luxury of fighting one form of oppression only. I cannot afford to believe that freedom from intolerance is the right of only one particular group, and I cannot afford to choose between the fronts upon which I must battle these forces of discrimination wherever they appear to destroy me. And when they appear to destroy me, it will not be long before they appear to destroy you.